I'm Dave Mowry of the Haas School of Business, UC Berkeley, and I am here to introduce the following video celebrating the career of Richard Nelson, a friend, mentor, collaborator, and co-author. In April 2022, Professor Marianne Feldman of Arizona State University, now serving as an officer of the Technology and Innovation Management Division at the Academy of Management, approached a group of colleagues to assemble a video tribute to Dick Nelson in connection with his Lifetime Achievement Award from the Academy. Wes Cohen of the Fuqua School of Management chaired an informal committee that, call, that contacted scholars, students, and former colleagues of Dick Nelson for brief tributes. The responses to our invitations were both positive and enthusiastic, reflecting the high esteem that all feel for Dick. The tributes that follow span three broad areas of Dick's lifetime of academic work and contributions. First, Dick's seminal work on the economics of innovation and evolutionary economic theory. Second, Dick's creative work supporting the formation of new organizations and institutions dedicated to research on innovation economics and policy. Third, Dick's extraordinary record of mentorship that has spanned decades and generations of students, many of whom now are leading scholars in the economics of innovation and evolutionary theory. I speak for all the contributors to the video tribute that follows in expressing our great pleasure in honoring Professor Richard Nelson's Lifetime Achievement Award. He has created and transformed an important area of social science research while training the researchers who in turn contributed to its advancement. Dick is that rarest of academic and intellectual leaders, someone who is both a world-class scholar and mentor and a world-class human being. All the best, Dick. Hi, Michael Crow here, president of Arizona State University, and I want to talk about Dick Nelson, one of the greatest economists of the last several hundred years. I, I put Dick up at the level of Friedman, uh, Pareto, no joke, I mean, because he, he uh, transformed our basic understanding of the role of research and development in the advancement of the modern economy of human beings. I mean, it is a powerful set of things that Dick has done uh, not only that, but the work that he did in evolutionary economics, the work that he's done in just driving an understanding of, of inventions and, and patents and discoveries and uh, uh, the whole notion of what's intrinsic and extrinsic. I mean, I worked with Dick for more than a decade at Columbia University, but, but before that, when I was a lonely PhD student at Syracuse and he was on the economics faculty at Yale, I sent him my dissertation idea that I, that I was working on, which is related to uh, evaluating R&D laboratories, and the guy took a huge amount of time, I'd never even met him at that point, to uh, respond to my dissertation idea. And I just have always found Dick Nelson to be one of the most intellectually capable, humble, driven individuals that I've ever had the pleasure of working with. I mean, whatever Lifetime Achievement Awards that he's getting, he deserves all of them. Uh, because he has done so much to enhance what at the end of the day uh, will be seen as the fundamental understanding of the role of human ingenuity, human invention, human discovery, the role of research in advancing our species. We are a species that had very little economic growth and very little economic change for tens of thousands of years. And then now all of a sudden in the last 400 years, wonderful things have begun to happen in the last a hundred years, more wonderful things, and in the last 70 years, unbelievable things, and in the last 30 years, even greater things. Dick understands why all of this is happening, has helped us to understand it economically, mathematically, culturally, sociologically. So congratulations, Dick, you really deserve this uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. What stands out most for me is the versatility, the exceptional range of Dick's contributions. The decades over which Dick has contributed provide an obvious temporal marker. His first landmark publication was published in the American Economic Review in 1956. This was a year before Dick had started his first faculty job at Oberlin College. Three years later, 1959, another landmark, The Simple Economics of Basic Scientific Research in the Journal of Political Economy. In every succeeding decade, Dick has published as much significant work as most scholars would hope to produce in their entire careers. More than 60 years later, Dick, now 92, 
is still producing scholarly work. A second feature of the Nelson range is the variety of his methodologies. His first landmark papers applied classical theoretical methodologies and equilibrium models. With his reputation as a mainstream theorist established in the 1960s, Dick turned to the heterodox use of routines. This new direction resulted in the now classic book written with Sidney Winter, An Evolutionary Theory of Economic Change. Case histories are a third exceptional feature of Dick's range. In 1962, he published the results of his investigations on the development of transistors. In 1977, Nelson and Winter showed how innovation differed across agriculture, medical, and aircraft sectors. In recent years, Dick and his collaborators have produced case histories on medical innovations. Economic historians apart, most economists avoid case histories. That a top theorist also produces case histories is an inspiring example, which I selfishly hope will be more widely followed. Third, Dick has addressed a wide range of audiences. His early work has had an enduring influence on mainstream e economists. The subsequent evolutionary work has inspired research on the heterodox side. This two-sided influence alone puts Dick in a select band of scholars. Dick's work has shaped research in business schools at least as much as it has research in economics departments. Public policy has been another important arena. The celebrated monograph, The Moon and the Ghetto, provides a striking example. In spite of its wide range, there is an unusual coherence to Dick's work. Almost everything relates to long-run economic change enabled by technological advances and complementary institutions. This coherence makes the Nelson corpus much greater than the sum of its parts. Similarly, selfless contributions to the work of others makes his life work far greater than the sum of his own publications. In 1962, Dick helped convene a conference on the rate and direction of innovative, inventive activity. Sixty years later, the National Bureau of Economic Research held a conference to commemorate the 1962 conference. I don't have the time now to list the significant contributions of Dick's students. I personally could not be more grateful for Dick's diligent reading and constructive suggestions of nearly everything I have written since we first met 22 years ago, and I am far from the many who have thus benefited. Thanks. Heartfelt thanks, Dick. It's a great pleasure to join in this celebration of Dick Nelson, my longtime friend, colleague, and co-author. It's no secret that Dick and I go back quite a long way. We recently marked the 40th anniversary of the publication of our joint book on evolutionary theory, still in print. A period of 40 years may be hyperbolically described as forever when it takes place in the span of human lifetimes. But in this case, the subject subjective experience didn't, did seem to go quite fast. Before that, there was the period when we were trying to write that book, and that process was long and certainly experienced as such. Among other things, we turned to computer simulation to combine the key commitments of our evolutionary theory in logically tight special purpose models. That led to the publication of papers that subsequently appeared as book chapters. We owe a great debt to the graduate students, research assistants, and programmers who helped us acquire that set of skills for our adventure, uh, skills that Dick and I had not been previously very familiar with. We also must thank the many colleagues who have helped extend that research trajectory, especially Franco and the late Gigi, our co-authors on the History Friendly book. A key date in the evolution of the book was 1976, when I joined the Yale faculty and thereby became Dick's co-located colleague for the fourth time in our two careers. That co-location gave a, a great boost uh, to our effort to uh, complete our book and uh, extend our run long running plot against mainstream economic theory. And this was going even while I was teaching that same theory for a living in the Yale PhD program. 
Then before that, there was the paper revising phase when we thought we were revising my RAND prepent on the neo Schumpeterian theory of the firm into a joint article suitable for publication. It was a failure as a paper revision effort because the imagined article kept getting longer. But the effort did have a reasonable motive because a realistic theory of the firm is a key ingredient not only of evolutionary theory, but also of economic insight into innovation, organizational learning, and the challenges of management more generally. Of course, haggling over the meaning of realism can go on and on. But as Giovanni likes to remind us, one thing is clear, mainstream microeconomics has traditionally been realism scorning, and mostly it still is. That is a big obstacle to scientific progress. What Dick brought to our collaboration, even as the young scholar of a half a century ago, included his wide knowledge of innovation as a phenomenon and familiarity with the literature thereof. An important part of that was his exposure to the UK branch of that inquiry as represented by Chris Freeman, Keith Pavitt, and others. Dick's own contributions to the understanding of innovation go far beyond his direct involvement with evolutionary theory. An interesting exercise is to try to make a list of the many intellectual forebearers of our current understanding of innovation. That understanding sees innovation as a social process at multiple interacting levels, from the contending voices in individual heads to research groups, business firms, universities, research institutes, industries, whole economies. And all of that is shaped idiosyncratically by the circumstances of a variety of time periods and historical settings. There would be many imposing names on such a list of forebearers, but it seems that the Nelson name is on there several times with complementary but quite distinct messages to offer, you know, like the two different Schumpeters of TED and CSD. There is, however, one big theme that cuts across those many contributions and perhaps restores our confidence in the ontology of one Nelson. This theme is Dick's institutional wisdom, which is consistently penetrating, nuanced, judicious, and informed. Above all, it is responsive to the empirical realities of whatever field that he has in focus. And behind all that, there are the fundamental values of a great human being, unmistakably strong, rarely, if ever, imperious in statement. So, Dick, we salute you and your many contributions. Your insights are needed even more today as our species struggles to shape new institutions that will help it survive in a paradoxical selection environment, an environment that our species has made extra hazardous by its own technological mastery. In honor to praise uh, the contribution of Dick Nelson to evolutionary economics. In fact, uh, uh, Dick, uh, together with Sid, Sid Winter and Chris Freeman, is uh, one of the three founding fathers of modern evolutionary economics. Uh, what do I mean by evolutionary economics? Well, <clears throat> in my view, is uh, in brief, is a new paradigm in, by which uh, Econ the economy is interpreted as a complex evolving system and that uh, a wide uh, set of techno-economic techno phenomena are understood as emergent properties, that is, the outcome from uh, out of equilibrium interaction among heterogeneous agents. These agents are characterized by endogenous preferences, 
most often by bounded rationality writ in large, but always capable of learning, adapting, uh, uh, innovating with respect to their understanding of the world, uh, the way they operate, uh, the technology that they master, the organizational form, and all that nested in a multitude of uh, institutions. This, I think, is the, the program. Now, increasingly, and this is a worry, evolutionary economics is understood as uh, the economics of innovation. Now, Dick, Chris, Sid, thought, and I fully agree, that was, uh, innovation was an, an excellent place where to start uh, to study the evolution of modern economic system. Because innovation and technical change is, in fact, uh, a fundamental engine of, uh, uh, of change uh, uh, and transformation. But evolution economics is not qualified by the economics of innovation. In fact, the economics of innovation has, has become uh, another subfield of economics, like uh, industrial economics, like uh, macroeconomics. Uh, and you can do macroeconomics in very different ways. You can be Keynes or you can be Milton Friedman. The evolutionary paradigm involves, first, the, the evolutionary analysis of innovation. Second, the implications for the structure and evolution of industries. Three, uh, microeconomic foundations based on what people and organization actually do, answering to the, the call of Herb Simon to have uh, economics as an empirical discipline. Um, it, the great uh, merit, seminal merit of Dick and Sid has been precisely to put together this element in a coherent framework. Progress has been made. I want to finish by praising uh, uh, Dick uh, also for uh, his uh, civil passion. I mean, evolutionary analysis uh, for Dick uh, uh, has, has meant understanding better how the world works uh, in order to make it a better place to live. I mean, uh, uh, Dick has written uh, an evolutionary theory of economic change, uh, but has written also The Moon and the Ghetto. Uh, and uh, the civil passion has been uh, the, the normative drive uh, throughout uh, his uh, uh, career. And this is fundamental, as fundamental as uh, the scientific contribution. Nelson's contributions to our understanding of the determinants of technical advance are foundational, expansive, varied, and continuous. So prolific <clears throat> are his contributions that Professor Franco Malerba and I are dividing the task. I will comment on Dick's early contributions. First, understand that Dick, in two 1959 publications, was one of the first to argue that technological change could be explained as the outcome of firms' investment responses to profit incentives, thus bringing the study of technological change into the tent of modern economic analysis. While highlighting the role of market incentives, Dick was also the first to highlight their limits. His 59 JPE publication pioneered the argument that due to the positive external effects of research, its social returns exceed its private returns. Hence, firms would underinvest in research from a social welfare perspective. This argument provides the core economic justification for public support. While the importance of science for technical advance was long appreciated, no mechanism expressly linking science and innovation was ever posited until Nelson's 59 Journal of Business article, Illuminating the Role of Science. He stated, quote, in the activity of invention, the actor has a number of alternative paths from which to choose. The greater 
his knowledge of the relevant fields, the more likely he will find a satisfactory path and the fewer the number of tried alternatives. Thus, the greater the underlying knowledge, the lower the expected cost of making any particular invention. His 82 QJE article advanced this idea by characterizing R&D as a search and scientific understanding is guiding that search. Again, reflecting the centrality of uncertainty to Dick's thinking about innovation, his 61 RE stat piece posited that for firms uncertain about the best approach to a technical objective, they should pursue parallel approaches and reallocate resources as uncertainty is resolved. Characteristic of the broad sweep of his work, Dick subsequently elevated this intuition to an economy-wide level, arguing in his 81 Bell Journal piece that the strength of capitalist economies is that they allow for the running of different experiments through the introduction of different products and different approaches to addressing consumer needs from which ex post the market selects. Dick also advanced our understanding of the process of invention through a 61 history of the origins of the transistor. Until this time, policymakers subscribed to the linear model of innovation. In a study of 1940s Bell Labs, Dick described how Shockley found that a semiconducting prototype did not work as predicted. This led Shockley to revise both his theory of the electrical characteristics of semiconductors and its subsequent implementation. Accordingly, Dick argued that innovation often reflects the interaction of the different stages of the inventive process, where basic research is often not the first step. This observation provides a rationale for strong ties between the basic and more applied sciences and between those and development and other downstream activities. On a personal note, I also want to express my utmost gratitude to Dick as advisor and mentor whose influence on my career has been profound. Dick, thank you. It is so great to be here and celebrate uh, you, Dick. Your contributions to the understanding of technological change and innovation are foundational. While Westcoin will focus on the period before 1980, I will focus on the period after. All your work has to be placed within your interest in the relationship between technology and long-run economic change, with knowledge and innovation playing a central role in the economy as a dynamic evolving system. I will not focus on your dynamic view of appropriability and on the role of patents, which will be discussed by Robert Merges. Rather, I want to concentrate on two main sets of contributions. One regard the uneven progress of knowledge and technology within long-run economic change, with quite different dynamics in industries and countries. This is all masterfully discussed in various research policy, industrial and corporate change, and SCAD papers, in the examination of medical technologies, and in the book Sources of Industrial Leadership. Also, your work on history-friendly models points to the role of innovation, co-evolutionary processes, and the diversity across industries and also represent a great application of the methodology that you propose in your 1982 book with Sid Winter. Empirical analysis and appreciative theory have to drive the building of formal economic models with the need of a continuous interaction between the modeler and the empirical researcher. Another group of your fundamental contributions concern the key role of institutions and innovation systems. You strongly point out that institutions are major players in generating technological change and economic growth, and that the institutional structure has to be seen as co-evolving over time with technology. And of course, government and public policy play a central role in this process. 
Here I would like to remember your foundational papers in research policy, GIBO, and industrial and corporate change, and your pioneering book on national innovation systems, in which the analysis of innovation, institutions, and industries is done in a dynamic and comparative way across a wide variety of countries. This view of institutions has always been also present in your work on catch up by emerging uh, countries, in which economic development is seen as a learning process and in which institutions, learning and capability building drive different paths of innovation and catch up. Let me just add by saying that in the analysis of innovation and technological change, you have also been a unique example of a great intellectual leader able to aggregate other top scholars around your work and your vision, and able to launch, inspire, and push path-breaking, complex, and dynamic and comparative projects, such as national innovation system or sources of industrial leadership. So thank you so much, Dick, for all your foundational contribution and for your unique inspiration to all of us. If I think about Dick's contribution to my field, uh, broadly, the economics of IP rights, um, I would uh, put it in three different categories. I think, first of all, the, the uh, early empirical work that he did with uh, Al Clavoric and uh, um, <clears throat> a couple of others, um, that was the first time that anybody had tried to delve into what you might call the microeconomics of, of patents. There were a lot of econometric studies prior to that. Many of you know the work of Zvi Grilich's, people like that, uh, Schmuckler. But these were at a very macro level, as you know. Um, uh, quite quite high levels of aggregation uh, and uh, not at all industry specific or institutionally uh, uh, oriented. And uh, Dick's um, empirical work uh, funded by Brookings and first published there uh, was really the first of the newer generation that tried to ask questions uh, specific to each industry and get under the skin a little bit about how each industry experienced the patent system and how patents worked uh, and didn't work. And in particular, um, the big contribution in addition to just a new style was also um, that the uh, empirical work here placed the patent system in an overall context of a suite of government policies that affect uh, R&D incentives. And um, in, in the past, in keeping with a lot of the, the sort of tradition of patent law, it had been treated as a sort of an isolated uh, system unto itself. So the trade-offs and interrelationships with other R&D policies, tax credits, subsidies, um, employment policies, all of the things that Dick uh, made, made famous later in his book on national innovation systems, um, Dick was the first, along with his co-authors, to try to put patents into that context for each industry. And in particular to the paper that he and I wrote on patent scope, it was <clears throat> one of the first times that anybody had really sort of unwrapped a particular patent doctrine in the law and economics mode, uh, but tried to use the um, economic literature on innovation, R&D, all of Dick's uh, special topics. So it was the first application of that body of literature to a doctrinal question in, in patent law. And it was a good time to be thinking about that because the Federal Circuit Court was new when we published in 1990, and people were interested in patent matters and how the Federal Circuit was affecting um, uh, various policy instruments with some of its doctrinal innovations. And of course, the other thing that that, that paper does is it encodes or embeds a career-long concern, a career-long concern that Dick has, which is preserving multiple and rivalrous sources of research. Um, uh, Dick's concern with over-concentration of R&D uh, and uh, uh, too much centralization comes through clearly in our recommendations that we, meant, we made for patent scope. So uh, I'm proud of that paper because it 
uh, pays attention uh, to the effect of, of patent policy um, on economic variables beyond simple incentives all the way to its effect on industry structure. And um, that, of course, now is a, is a sub-literature all unto itself. Um, <clears throat> anyway, to wrap up, uh, Dick's been a great mentor and friend for many years. I'm really glad to be part of this celebration. In the summer of 1991, Professor Richard, Professors Richard Nelson, Richard Levin, and myself went to Moscow. We were invited by the Russian Academy of Science. We are part of the group of Western economists who are asked to advise the transition of transition process of Russian economy from uh, planned economy to market economy. The leader of our, our group was Professor Joe Peck of Yale. Particularly, we are asked to talk about technology development in market economies. Rick Levin, who later became president of Yale, talked about technology development in the United States, and I talked about Japan. Somehow, we both talked in a similar way, first private sector R&D, then research and education at university sector. Lastly, government policy. Rick and I did not have talked about how to organize our talks, but ended up more or less talking in a similar manner. Dick seems to find uh, seemed to find this interesting and asked afterwards if we, Rick and myself, talked and agreed to beforehand to organize our presentations in a similar way, which we did didn't. When one talks about technology development in a nation, one talks about private sector and the university and government policy. I have a secret feeling that this episode has something to do with the beginning of the concept national innovation system. I may be wrong, of course. The concept might be the product of Dick's deep thinking and learning. But I'd like to think that something had happened in our trip to Moscow. In any event, Dick Nelson, Rick Levin, and myself went to Moscow in the 19, in 1991 when Russian economy was at its lowest. All of the shelves of the gun was empty. And we have we had to eat the same meal for six days. And we talked about what is later known as National Innovation System. Later, I joined the National Innovation Project, Dick organized and wrote a chapter on Japan. In that project, I got to know the great thinkers such as Chris Freeman and Keith Tavit. In addition, Dick and myself with Hiro Odagiri edited a volume on the role of patent system in economic development of 11 nations. Dick made it possible all of these for me. Thank you. It's a true pleasure to have the opportunity to say a few words about Dick Nelson's impact on scholarship in management and strategy on the occasion of his Lifetime Achievement Award from the Academy of Management. I have had the privilege and honor of being a student of Dick's, not only at Yale, but also over my entire career. He has had a remarkable impact in the area of technology strategy and innovation management, and in the field of strategic management as a whole. The voluminous amount of research on dynamic capabilities in these fields, particularly with respect to technological innovation, is closely tied to Dick's seminal book with Sid Winner on an evolutionary theory of economic change. It is notable that their book was one of the first research endeavors to bring together firm capabilities and technological innovation. Subsequently, Dick wrote an important and highly cited article entitled, Why Do Firms Differ and How Does It Matter?, which was published in the Strategic Management Journal. This article spelled out the evolutionary economic logic for why we observe heterogeneity among competing firms 
and why these differences persist over time, issues that are at the heart of strategic management. Indeed, it would be difficult to think of a more fundamental issue in the field. Dick's research has also inspired a large volume of work in management and strategy on the sources of knowledge for technological innovation by firms, including but not limited to the relationships between firms and university research. In addition, Dick wrote a wonderful article published in Strategic Management Journal on why should managers be thinking about technology policy. This piece connects Dick's seminal work on national innovation systems with management and business. The role of government institutions more generally, including with respect to innovation, is something that Dick has continued to write about up to the present day, reminding us that economies and the firms in them don't function in a pure market environment and we shouldn't be pretending otherwise. In closing, it would be difficult to overstate the profound impact that Dick has had on our understanding of business firms, their strategies, and their relationship to innovation. Both how innovations by firms lead to technological change and how technological change affects firm innovation. Thank you, Dick, for opening up so many areas of research and for your profound insights and impact on management and strategy research. Early in our careers, uh, Richard Nelson befriended me at the RAND Corporation where I was working in my first job as an economist in 1959-60. I saw that he was that rare example of an economist doing original theoretical and empirical work. Later, when, as it happens, uh, we were both back at Yale, um, he solved the problem I was having with the golden rule of saving that I was working on. After I left Yale, I heard Richard's talk at the American Economic Association. I made a point while he, I, I, at the end of his talk, and he invited me to co-author the paper, Investment in Humans, Technological Diffusion, and Economic Growth. He was always very generous. Over the years, I saw that he was one of the first to do fresh work on economic growth. Until Dick came along, economists seemed happy just to do theoretical modeling in the shadow of Robert Solow. Dick Nelson went much in the much wider areas. At Columbia, Dick and I work largely in differing areas, but that didn't stop us from having occasional uh, lunches over the many years. Our research efforts have gone in different directions, but our friendship has remained intact over the past 63 years. Hi, Dick Nelson. This is a treat, uh, making a short video to, uh, to commemorate you. Um, we go back a long ways. I have really great memories of the uh, evolutionary models in the social sciences seminar that you ran at ISPS. Um, I recall many discussions with you and Sid about your 1980 book. Um, I've long felt the impact of the terrific chapter on routines. I think that was a gem. Um, I recall fondly the encouragement uh, that you gave Paul DiMaggio and I. Um, I know when we were writing our chapter, um, The Iron Cage Revisited. Uh, while at ISPS, you were just a, a remarkable uh, leader. Um, our organizational alternative seminar was an extraordinary event. I think it was a high point in many of our careers uh, and you were such a catalyst for it. 
once you moved to Columbia, you took on a different role, uh, all that important work on, uh, on innovation and innovation regimes. Um, we intersected over work on the commercialization of science and the commercialization of the academy. Um, in general, the work on science, innovation, and the academy was uh, really important and I think continues to be so today as, uh, as the world of technology and the university continue to uh, interweave and interpenetrate one another. I learned a great deal about institutions from you, Dick, um, both how to study them and how they operate and, frankly, how to manage them. And as I sit in my current role as director of the Center for Advanced Study, I often reflect back on the things you did when you were director of the Institute of Social and Policy Studies. I've often used your work, uh, chapters, papers, and my classes, and I've always been influenced in my own writing. But I think more than anything else, Dick, I think you personify an academic mensch. You've been a mentor to so many people and really a model of what a scholar should be and one I've tried to emulate. So thank you very much for all you've done for research in the social sciences. You're much appreciated. Take care. Dear Nick, this is uh, Dominique Forêt. I'm talking from Lausanne. Your contribution to the economics of science, of innovation, public policy, growth, productivity is so important, rich, and influential that it's very difficult to, for me to make a choice to highlight a particular aspect of your work. So perhaps let's um, the news decide for me. The phenomenal speed of uh, innovation during the, the COVID crisis uh, came as a surprise for um, most uh, innovation scholars who knows well the problems of vaccine research market failures, science inelasticity, and so predicted that the prospect for investing uh, um, and inventing a vaccine within a year was totally irrealistic. And the prediction was wrong. Actually. Then some among us uh, developed the concept of crisis innovation to explain how a crisis can boost the innovation system, forcing it to transform itself and, 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 and prepare itself for the battle in order to um, meet the challenge and succeed. Okay, I think that um, crisis innovation is a useful category but in a sense, it does not explain why what worked for COVID did not work for um, the climate crisis and a few other crises. And this is the key question for our difficult and turbulent times. And the response, as we all know, was elaborated by yourself around 1975 in your book, The Moon and the Ghetto a book which was perhaps misunderstood by this time, but is fully cheered and acclaimed now by many. As regarding the COVID crisis, your argument uh, you wrote by this time is still valid. You wrote, there was a clear path to a solution. And this does not apply for the climate crisis. So 50 years ago, you provided an essential framework to understand the nature of the grand challenges of our times, which are not only, and perhaps not essentially, about science and technology. Thanks for this, Dick. I have great memories uh, of our, and of your visits in Switzerland, in Lausanne, in Monte Verita, of our collaborations for a few um, uh, special issues in research policy and economics of innovation and technology. Alors, merci beaucoup for your extraordinary intellectual legacy. Among the many contributions by Dick Nelson that we celebrate today is his work that has deepened our understanding of the role and significance of university scientific research within the U.S. national innovation system. As early as 1959, Dick's classic JPE article, 
explain why we can't rely on the private sector to set, undertake sufficient scientific research to satisfy the needs of society, and made the case for federal funding of basic research by universities. Dick's pioneering work with Nate Rosenberg also showed us that universities, at least in the US, are not just ivory towers that produce research outcomes that are of little interest in industry. On the contrary, US universities, particularly land grant institutions, have historically emphasized the resolution of practical problems of local industry. This industrial orientation led to the merchants of the fields of chemical engineering, electrical engineering, aeronautical engineering, and computer science within American university departments. Dick's work also highlighted that relative to university systems and other advanced economies, the US universities have enjoyed a high level of autonomy with an absence of centralized government control and that they regularly compete for funds, prestige, faculty, and students. These factors have led to the creation of links between academic and industrial researchers. And these links have produced many important innovations in industry and agriculture, as pointed out by Dick. The passage by Congress of the landmark Bayh-Dole Act of 1980, which facilitated the patenting and licensing of academic inventions, was associated with an explosion of technology transfer from universities to industry. Dick's insights have put the consequences of that act into perspective. He was one of the first scholars to question the conventional wisdom that patenting was always necessary for the transfer of academic inventions to industry. We also understand now that factors other than Bayh-Dole, such as the rise of the biotechnology industry, with its close linkages to academic biologists and medical faculty, and the strengthening of intellectual property, property rights generally, hap all happening at the same time, were factors behind the increase in university formal technology transfer to industry. Much of this understanding is due to Dick's scholarship. I had the tremendous good fortune as a graduate student to participate in some of the early analysis of the Bayh-Dole Act with Dick, my PhD advisor, David Maori, and Dick's student, Bob and Sampat. Dick's Columbia office was our command center where we would meet, compare notes, and debate the book we were writing. Dave and I made numerous trips to Manhattan, and Dick was always a most gracious host. Although I was a student 3,000 miles away in California, Dick didn't hesitate for an instant when I asked him to serve on my dissertation committee. His constructive criticism and guidance greatly influenced my work then, and his influence remains with me today. So Dick, thank you and congratulations on this most deserved Lifetime Achievement Award. I would like to recognize Professor Nelson's contributions to the field of public policy. After all, Professor Nelson's primary department for the past 30 years at Columbia has been public policy. As a field, public policy is simply microeconomics applied to the activities of government. Anyone who thinks business strategy is difficult should consider the complex and multifaceted problems that we ask government to address. Professor Nelson's 1979 book, The Moon and the Ghetto, asks the question, if we can land a man on the moon, why can't we solve the problems of the ghetto? As a society, we've become accustomed to spectacular technological achievements, and we've made great material progress. But for the most urgent problems that we face, the need for medical care delivered at a reasonable cost, the need for efficient mass transportation, for adequate housing, for education for everyone, we've not made sufficient progress. And Professor Nelson contributes to identifying the reasons for this very uneven technological process. And he explores ways that we might make progress. From the moon and ghetto, the concept of an innovation system emerges. And he considers the types of progress we want to make as a society, and then how we go about addressing human needs. And there are many lessons in the book that I think we need to repeat as we consider what is the role for government. And Nelson points out that 
the um, government is frequently berided because we haven't made enough progress, but it is really that we have unrealistic expectations, especially when we compare the public sector with the private sector. Societal problems are highly complex and they require complex solutions. There are no easy fixes. And then last but not least, Nelson advocates for sequential experimental approaches to hard problems and argues that any easy solutions are ultimately going to disappoint and disillusion us. So Professor Nelson, thank you for your contributions to the field of public policy. Congratulations, Dick, for this duly deserved recognition of your innumerable and invaluable contributions to economics, management, and the study of innovation and entrepreneurship. You are indeed the visible dean of our invisible college and is a privilege to be included in the session. My task is to, is to briefly situate your seminal activity at the early stages of your career, notably your organization of the 1962 NBER Rate and Direction of Inventive Activity Conference and Volume. You had already made foundational contributions to the economics of technological change, including the simple economics of basic research, parallel research lines, crystallizing the role of science and research as a public good with implications for the funding and management of R&D itself. However, it was your organization leadership and individual contribution to the Rate and Direction Conference that exemplifies your unique and your unique and enduring ability to assemble and inspire talented researchers to synthesize a new analytical frame and establish an entire field. Your introduction lays the intellectual foundations that echo for decades to come in the classical economics approach and the black box. You state several of the papers in the volume throw serious doubt on the ability of inventors to predict, requiring us to look quite deeply at the insides of the black box, at the R&D process itself. If these conclusions are generally correct, prediction might, models might well consider a wider class of behavior than is treated in classical economic analysis. You then exemplify this approach in your fascinating study of the transistor and its invention at Bell Labs, yielding insights that form the basis of research even today, including uncertainty, innovation management, researcher freedom, and the duality of science and technology. And of course, prompting your colleague Ken Arrow, prompting your colleague Ken Arrow to contribute to the volume induced along with your own work, the Arrow-Nelson paradigm that informs innovation policy to this day. Josh Herner and I had the privilege to organize a 50th anniversary conference in 2010, honoring the 1962 volume, featuring both new research directions, but also reflecting on the original. In collaboration with our deeply missed mentor and friend, Nate Rosenberg, we asked, why was rate and direction so important? Nate and I answered that question by noting that Dick used the opportunity of the rate and direction volume to bring together an extraordinary and diverse group of scholars that focused on identifying a systematic research program focusing on the nature of innovation as an economic good, the organization of research and development, and the interrelationship between innovation and the dynamics of industry structure. The volume offered a timely counterpoint to the macroeconomic approach that equated technological change with the residual and treated innovation as exogenous. We said the 1962 volume served as a decisive role in establishing the microeconomics of innovation and technological change. I would like, of course, to go on, but the organizers have limited us to just a few minutes. Just goes to show you that you've taught them well. I'll simply close with a heartfelt thank you for your pioneering contributions, your personal kindness, and your leadership that have prompted economists and management scholars to dig into the black box of innovation both as a phenomenon in its own right, but also as a tool for economic and social progress. Congratulations again, and thank you, thank you for including me in this wonderful program.
I'm delighted to participate in this celebration of Dick's extraordinary career and to talk about his time at Yale. 12 years after completing his PhD, Dick returned to New Haven in 1968 as a professor of economics and a charter member of the team of broad-gauge social scientists that Ed Lindblom was assembling at the newly established Institution of Social and Policy Studies. By the time I arrived on campus as a graduate student, only two years later, Dick was a prominent feature of the landscape. He already had a substantial coterie of graduate students that included Paul Joskow and Ken Warner, among others, and he soon was to attract dozens more. His course on market organization and public policy was essential leavening for a curriculum heavily laden with theory and econometrics. As a more advanced graduate student told some of our first, some of us first years, it will remind you why you decided to go to graduate school. And in truth, Dick's course did more than that. We were inspired by Dick's striking originality and challenged to think hard about what kind of economists we wanted to be. He gave us, in his own familiar words, a roadmap through graduate school and beyond. Dick made important institutional contributions during his time at Yale, inviting many unconventional speakers and sabbatical year visitors to liven discussion, recruiting Sid Winter, and serving as director of the Institution for Social and Policy Studies for six years. But without a doubt, his greatest impact was as a mentor. Dick made every one of his students and junior faculty colleagues feel appreciated. He and Catherine welcomed us regularly at their home, where Dick had a knack for making even the shyest of graduate students feel comfortable. He was immensely generous with his time. He read every draft of his students and faculty colleagues, and he found a way to praise them even as he offered penetrating criticism. He went out of his way to support and give feedback to young faculty whose applied work on policy relevant topics was not fully appreciated by the economics department. Among these, John Quigley, Rick Hanischek, Dick Murnane, and Susan Rose Ackerman went on to become leaders in their respective fields. Only three of the contributors to this video were Dick's students at Yale, Wes Cohen, Bronco Malerba, and me. But I suspect that everyone involved was inspired by Dick, felt his generosity of spirit, and considers him their mentor. I'm Paul Nightingale from SPRU, the Science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex. I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes about the role Richard Nelson plays in building institutions. Now, I could talk about lots of institutions from all around the world, but I'm going to focus on SPRU, because that's the institution I know best. We were founded in the 1960s, and Richard, I think, has been coming to SPRU since the 1970s. And during that time, he has been SPRU's best and oldest friend. In fact, I think it was in SPRU in 1977 that he first outlined in the seminar the ideas that informed the 1982 book he wrote with Sid Winter. Now, his ideas suggest to build institutions, you need five things. First of all, time. And Richard has been supporting Spru for generations. He was a great friend and collaborator with my PhD supervisor, Keith Pavitt, an amazing mentor to me when I was a PhD student and postdoc, a fantastic help to my own PhD student, Ohid Jakub, when he was in Colombia. And now Ohid and I have a new generation of PhD students that draw on his ideas. Second, you need to work. And Richard is famous for his work ethic. He flies over from New York on the red eye and comes straight into the office. Third, institutions need to network. They don't exist in isolation. So Richard plays a vital role in creating a bridge between the North American and European research traditions and linking researchers all around the world so that they can collaborate together. Fourthly, you need to be distinctive. And there Richard's huge intellect has been really, really useful and helpful in SPRU in providing us with a distinctive way of looking at the world. Richard is famous in SPRU for the role he plays in seminars. So when a seminar question comes to him, he doesn't go straight away with a question, he's thoughtful. He leans back slightly in his chair, brings his fingers together like this and thinks for a while, 
and then comes up with a really, really insightful comment that's really helpful, not just for the seminar speaker, but for everyone in the room. And then lastly, institutions need a culture. And Richard helps provide that culture by being an example, not just in his academic intellect, but also as a person. Richard is one of the kindest, most generous people I've ever met. He's fantastic in supporting PhD students and always has time for them. But he's also really supportive to everyone in the institution, all the way up to the top professors. So through those five ways, Richard has been a fantastic institution builder. And I'd like to support everyone here in celebrating the amazing work that he's done in helping our entire international academic community. Thank you, Richard. My great pleasure to give a tribute to Dick Nelson and to indicate the great contributions he's made, not just to SPRU, but to the broader community of scholars interested in innovation. There's no doubt that Richard Nelson is the most preeminent scholar in the world when it comes to technological innovation and its impact on the business enterprise and the economy. He combines an understanding of institutions, the business firm, and more macroeconomic phenomena. It's really been remarkable that he's been able to plow the turf that he's done, and much of it uh, while he was uh, involved with Spru. Spru has always been on the tip of Dick Nelson's tongue. Um, he was always advancing its cause. Uh, he was always giving accolades, not just to its founders like Chris Freeman, but others that followed. And uh, he created a community of scholars uh, globally with, um, I'd like to think of Spru as one of those anchors and UC Berkeley is another and for a while Columbia University is a third. So these institutions have worked together productively and professionally and collegially over many, many years. And there are students uh, that Dick has had that have continued this tradition. So we owe Dick a lot, uh, not just for his substantive ideas, but for the community that he's helped create and the community that he's helped lead. There is no better mentor that anyone would wish for than Richard Nelson. He reads everybody's work and he provides comments. And sometimes, you know, I'm sure it's tough for him because some of the work uh, isn't of the quality that he would aspire to see it be. So we have to take our hats off and uh, all of us have um, uh, many things in common, but we have one thing in common that we all cherish, and that is the fact that we've all benefit, benefited in one way or another from Dick Nelson's engagement and involvement. And that extends to industrial and corporate change. Of course, the Oxford Press Journal uh, and the Nelson Prize, which is joint to this day between Spru and UC Berkeley. So he has, uh, not only contributed a lot at SPRU, but he's helped create a community at SPRU that's connected and linked to scholars, not just in the United States, but elsewhere in the world as well. So, so thank you, Dick, and um, we look forward to your continued involvement and engagement on important issues of science and technology policy as we roll forward into a world where there is bifurcated governance at best, and where alliances between Europe, the United States, and Korea, Japan, and so forth, alliances to develop uh, and commercialize new technologies are gonna be increasingly important. So the foundations that you've helped sprue lay, that connectedness is really now going to be the fulcrum to enable um, the democracies, the Western democracies, uh, to compete strategically and sensibly uh, with, with with other uh, strategic competitors. So thank you, Dick. Professor Nelson, I'm delighted to be able to talk to you in these couple of minutes together with my colleague Bart Verspagen, my successor here at the Institute UNU Merit. Back in 1987, if you remember, you were with some colleagues instrumental in the creation of the IFIAS book the book which we here produced in 87, 88, and which was the basis for the creation of the Institute Merit. You've been with Merit together with Chris Freeman, Nate Rosenberg, many others. And if you remember, in 92, 
we made an attempt to convince Ken Arrow to have you and Sid Winter integrated in the Canadian Institute of Advanced Research. We even organized a conference on the topic in, back in 92. And you've been with us, continuing supporting us, Merit, and now you and you, Merit, since then. Wacht. Yes, dear Dick, I'm also very happy to uh, be able to say a few words to you together with Luke. Um, I'm actually uh, thinking about all those times. As you know, I've been with the Institute for uh, a long while as well. And Luke mentions 1987, 88, and I was actually an undergraduate student at that time. And I remember that this famous professor from the US, uh, Richard Nelson, would come to us. And the thing that amazed me at the time, which was really uh, something quite extraordinary, was that you were supposed to give a lecture and then uh, in front of the full audience you sat back and you thought for a little while and then you said let me give you the choice of two topics and you let us students, undergraduate students, determine which of the two topics you were going to talk about and of course you had no way of knowing what we were going to choose but it was a perfect lecture, very convincing very interesting, and I remember that as the start of, uh, of a long history of you coming to you and you merit always getting these terrific stories that uh, captured the audience in a, in a fantastic way. So. so congratulations, Dick, and good luck. Dear Dick, uh it's a great honor and pleasure to uh, have this chance to tell you how much you mean for, uh, for me as a colleague and a friend. Uh, and I'm going to talk specifically about the important role you have played in uh, helping to build uh, the GlobalX uh, network. I don't know if you remember, but uh, when we celebrated you around 2000 in New York, I gave you a small envelope uh, where there was a paper in it uh, telling you that uh, GlobalX was coming on and uh, we regarded you as uh, uh, one of the uh, most important patrons of uh, GlobalX. Um, and you joined the activities from the very beginning. Uh, you uh, uh, joined the Global X Scientific Board. Uh, you came to the first conference in 2003. And uh, you uh, were extremely active also uh, through your important project on catching up, which uh, had many of its meetings in connection with uh, uh, Global X conferences. And also, I would say uh, you, you uh, uh, were extremely uh, generous and uh, uh, oriented towards sharing knowledge, especially with the young scholars from uh, developing countries, etc. So, uh, I would say that that while you today uh, often focus on uh, the contribution of a scholar in terms of number of uh, publications and citations, um, in your case, uh, even if you would come up out at the very top in rankings, etc., this would uh, much underestimate your role in relation to building uh, our common field of knowledge on innovation studies, etc., cetera. Uh, you have brought uh, to uh, GlobalX and to many other contexts uh, a special culture, uh, which is characteristic, uh, characterized by uh, uh, an extreme generosity, uh, by knowledge sharing and by uh, bringing uh, 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 your resources uh, to help uh, young scholars and scholars from the South. And I would say that uh, this uh, type of culture 
is actually the most important prerequisite for building uh, new institutions in our field. So once again, uh, Dick, uh, thanks a lot and have a very nice day today. Hi. I want to take a few minutes to uh, to talk about, or as Dick might say, reflect on Dick Nelson as a mentor. I started working with Dick when I was a sophomore in college and worked with him throughout grad school in economics and, um, and since. And Dick was, and indeed is, the epitome of an academic mentor, uh, of a good academic mentor. He is first patient. Um, always available to meet and to discuss ideas. Dick opens doors. Um, he introduced me to leading scholars in in the field um, and, and to policymakers, um, including some who I continue to work with today. He reads drafts carefully, um, providing detailed feedback and the types of feedback you wouldn't get from anyone else. But perhaps most importantly, Dick opens up new vistas. Um, I remember even when I was in grad school, while recognizing I was going through a, um, a relatively conservative neoclassical PhD program, Dick gently urged me to read more broadly and to think more broadly. Um, as I've reflected to others, once you see the world uh, in a Nelsonian way, it's difficult to unsee that. Um, and that's had a, a profound influence on me. Um, but perhaps more important than his um, formal academic mentoring. He's a role model for how one should be as an academic. Um, from the beginning and to this day, an unbounded enthusiasm and energy um, and a real intellectual curiosity about understanding the world and, and getting it right. Um, more than how something should be written or where it might be published or if the methods are in fashion, um, Dick models the importance of getting it right and really understanding the world using whatever tools um, are out there um, and understanding the world to make it better. And then perhaps most importantly, uh, a friend. He cares about his students, uh, not just as students, not even primarily as, as academics, but as, um, as people. And what he's done for me as his formal student, he's done for many, many others informally over the years, including um, those uh, who were not formally under his, his supervision. A Chinese graduate student who Dick and I um, had lunch with um, at a conference, I think in Milan many years ago, put it best. Um, unfortunately, I forget the name of the student, but uh, he described Dick as the, the nicest big shot he'd ever met. And I think that's, that's about right. Um, so uh, a real role model, though I'm still working on the unbounded energy and enthusiasm. Hopefully that will come with age, he has had a tremendous influence on, on me, how I see the world, how I do research. And fortunately, I think the essential Nelsonian traits, uh, an appreciation for institutional detail, context, history, are now much more valued in the discipline than they once were, at least among economists studying innovation. And I think that's due to Dick's direct influence, um, but also his indirect influence on students and students of students uh, across the ages. So um, congratulations, Dick, and thanks from me and your many other students over the years and across the world. When I think about Dick as a mentor, there is one thing that comes to my mind right away. And the first thing that comes to my mind is that he made himself available to meet me whenever I wanted to meet. And this is really remarkable. It is even more remarkable now that I'm a faculty member myself and I'm quite busy and uh, making oneself available to doctoral students uh, clearly <laughs> takes time. And um, I try to follow Dick's role model a little bit in this, uh, in that I spend a lot of time with doctoral students, but it's time consuming. And so I really want to emphasize uh, how much I appreciate um, the many, many meetings that I had with Dick during my time at Columbia, where he was my coach to 
helped me do much better work than I could have done on my own. The second thing I want to remember or I want to point out is that what made Dick such a valuable mentor was that he was and he is very, very broad. And that means he doesn't look at things from a single disciplinary perspective, but he's widely read. And that meant that he was also enabling me to do a much broader dissertation than I would have ever done if Dick had not been my advisor. To give a bit of context, so at the time in the management department at Columbia, it was customary that uh, anyone working in strategy or TOT was doing primarily a quantitative dissertation. And my dissertation ended up having some quantitative data, but it was mainly descriptive and historical. And I would have never focused in my dissertation on what I would consider a comparative historical methodology if Dick had not provided the cover to do this. Um, so my own work would have been a lot more incremental than I think it has been in my dissertation if Dick had not encouraged me and provided cover to do something like this. Um, so I really wanted to pay tribute and say that uh, Dick is a role model and I'm not, or, and I'm trying to work with my doctoral students in a similar way that he worked with me. So thank you very much, Dick. Senior scholars can do wonderful things, but only some of them are also wonderful mentors and Dick is one of those. Gary Pisano can comment about that. Wes Cohen can comment about that. And my personal experience also is sort of shedding light on that wonderful quality of Dick's. I wrote him as a starting out newbie professor when he was as senior as he could be in the field. Didn't know that I'd get an answer. I asked him what he thought about a paper on user innovation. He wrote back, he wrote back with a page of helpful comments and criticisms and suggestions. It was wonderful that he would pay attention and respond. In those days, you had to send mail through the uh, postal service. And uh, I was very grateful and I improved my work as a consequence. And then we repeated this pattern and each time he was enormously kind and thoughtful in his responses. So thank you for for, for that wonderfulness, Dick. Over time, as with the case of many scholars in my generation, Dick added a social element in on his kind uh, mentorship. So my wife and I would visit him in his Cape Cod house. We would play ping pong. He would always win, but he would never make it so that I couldn't hope to compete someday in the future. He would just sort of win and give me hope that maybe something would change over time. Although every time I got better, he got better too, so I don't know, it never worked. He always won. But during these uh, visits, we would sit around and talk about research and talk about life. And it was just lovely and greatly, greatly, greatly appreciated by me and I'm sure many others. So thank you, Dick, for your wonderful qualities as not only a scholar, but as a human and a friend and a mentor. We all have gained enormously by these lovely qualities of yours. It is my great honor to confer the Academy of Management Tim Division inaugural Lifetime Achievement Award to Professor Richard Nelson in recognition of his many intellectual contributions. To provide some background, the Tim Division was formed in 1987. We now have over 3,000 active members who study innovation, research and development, and the management of technology-based organizations. These are the very topics where Professor Nelson has made his professional contributions. 
Indeed, his work has helped legitimize our endeavor. Now, if these were different times, I would present Professor Nelson with an engraved plaque and shake his hand. But I think you would all agree that this video has been a remarkable way to celebrate Professor Nelson's accomplishments. Let me conclude by thanking Professor Nelson for his contributions to the intellectual development and the growth of the field of scholarship that the Tim Division represents. Thank you.